What's going on, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Rolling Gas Service Podcast. We've got a return guest. We've got the guys from Rivet. We've got Clay and Miles. Clay, we were catching up after ET in Houston. Miles, I'll give you a little pass since you weren't there. Yeah. And you were telling me about all the cool things you guys are working on, all the success you guys have had over the years. It's been two years yeah. since you came on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Totally different studio. Yeah. This is much more high speed, low drag than uh, back then. But I was like, we have to get you guys back on. Tell some of these stories. You guys have a new product you're about to drop. So where do we want to begin? Like where, like what, what has happened in the last two years? We've had massive growth. And yeah. so when we, when we came on brand new anchoring in at one client, and since then we've deployed a completely wireless system, first of its kind, uh, never been done before. Um, Real time automated delivery to in different consumers, in different clients. We've seen Automated logistics. We've seen automated well actions, automated pump controls, all built on our infrastructure. And it's purely completion space, right? Yeah. I mean, the product right now is absolutely yeah. focused. Uh, frack, drill out. We can do production. Um, we also support support drilling sign. Yeah. Uh, we also integrated heavily with Bardash. So we were the first ones to successfully real-time capture all the data on completion pads and then have it structured, labeled, transformed into real-time consumable with XML. Wow. Uh, and so there's been a huge amount of stuff that we've accomplished. In. So for those who didn't listen to the first episode, how do you guys describe, and maybe this has changed since the first episode, how do you guys describe what you do at a high level? Okay, at a high level, um, we're a, a streaming application. So just like you log into a LinkedIn or a Twitter and you subscribe to people and you're pulling that feed in and you're watching it in real time, we do that for completions, for drill outs. We deploy our hardware out to sites, and then we stream all of that data both on site so vendors can build and automate, and then we deliver that real time to our clients' clouds, vendor clouds, wherever they need it. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of kind of like the plumbers, right? You just do all the dirty work, like we set up the pipelines and things like that. Everything that goes along with it, um, you know, guys in the field, trucks, boots on the ground, you know, all those kinds of things. So we don't drop ship or anything like that. So we stay due to that. So service company first, just really cool technology second. And you guys had both worked in this space. We're going to kind of touch on those background just once again, for those who who didn't listen to the first episode, you guys worked in this space. What was the opportunity that you saw? What was the need that was not being met? Sure. Uh, as far as working in the space, Clay was on frack for years, right? Almost 10 years. And then I was wireline and tubing conveyed perforating for years. So we had a really good understanding of just the functional operation and all the aspects. The need we saw was that companies, uh, all the standard companies today that you know, the brand names, Corvos, Cold Bores, they all consume data into their platform. And then you as the client had to come to them. You had to serve yourself on whatever they basically had on their menu for you. So what Rivet did is we reversed that. We capture all the data and then we send it all to them, 100%, stream directly into their cloud. Um, so we remove the, ta- the breach potential. We don't persist that data unless requested to. And so it really empowered their teams to begin building something that they'd always wanted, uh, but now had the ability. Is there any massaging of this data or is it you just give it to them raw and then they take it from there and run with it? There's a little bit uh, and it's really optional. But well, we always deliver 100% of the raw data in each payload, but then we also parse it and make it clean so it's easily sent. So whether they're sending it to one data store or another, uh, it comes in the same. So we're collecting from you and from Clay and from me and we're different vendors, different protocols. We standardize it all into the same shape. So it's really easy. It's really fast. And it makes it very quick for data science teams and business teams to pick it up and shove it into Power BI, Spotfire, uh, build their own custom thing. So you you unlock all of this new visibility into the entire completions process. What's the what's the business case? What does that allow you to do? Is it, are you more effective? Are you saving more money? Are you it, quicker? Um, the business case is, I'll use an example, right? So what are the biggest costs and consumables and fracturing or stimulation, right? So sand is probably one of the biggest ones, you know, of course, renting the pumps, all that stuff, right? You, paid, you pay for the time. But one thing you can have direct control over is, logistics, right? And then if you have multiple operations across a large base or something like that, you need to be able to reduce or prevent downtime or mitigate downtime, things like that. So one advantage is, is knowing, think of it, um, somebody who I kind of look up to a bit in the industry, 
uh, shared this with me, and he's he said you have to look at it um, at an operation as a mass balance equation. What goes in has to equal what goes out, but there always has it always has to be the balance. You can't be too low on one side, too high on the other, right? So to maintain like uh, optimum efficiency, you have to know exactly where you are, what's going in the hole. But by getting this data and making it available, sometimes we even will skip sending it to the cloud and we'll send it straight to a uh, logistics company. The, so it's a Sandy application or Vorto, I can't remember who it is, but we would send data real time to them and they would just automate these truck rolls. So it was kind of like McDonald's. There's no inventory. Nobody's strapping sand. Nobody's taking physical measurements. So as they're consuming tons and tons and tons of sand, you're able to pipe this over to the logistics company and they just are able to anticipate how much That's correct. to bring in the first place. That's correct. Yeah. So it's just truck rolls and they're just yeah. there. Yeah. So they're, that, that operator was never waiting on sand unless a bridge went out, right? <laughs> Something yeah. like that or the plant or where a train was behind or something, but what they could control, um, they, they, they did a great job mitigating it. So it, it's more about being you know, like, like the name implies rivet. It's a small piece, but it's integral. It holds together a larger structure, just little things like that connecting between operations, uh, for the operator and the dispatch company and independent, uh, contractors hauling sand. So walk me through, we've got a lot of history to cover here. So two years ago, still early on, walk me through like how the reception has changed from like the early days. And maybe this is because maybe y'all's pitch has changed as well, or maybe people sort of noticed the problem or they noticed that other things weren't really offering what you guys were. How has that evolved over the last couple of years? You know, a lot of it, a lot of it was about data ownership in the beginning. Let's prevent breach. We know that's a problem. If, if data is the new oil and that's the, the gold standard, then you want to control that. So originally we really came out hitting hard about ownership. Mm -hmm. What we've seen with the, the brokering of data on location is we facilitate safety uh, a lot more than anything. Like we can automate and we can prevent a lot of things, but if we know where the valves are, and frack knows where the valves are, then they have digital locks in place. They don't allow them to pump on closed valves. They don't allow wire line to drop on pressure that don't start transfer until the actual valves have opened. And so we've switched a lot more to safety and uh, basically layering on different events that can occur. Uh, and so that's been, a, that's been a big win. So if this is valves open, don't do this. Or if this valve's closed, do this. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to deadhead a $100,000 wellhead piece or something. You yeah, know what I mean, yeah. uh, it, it, I think it's also, we've done a better job of translating kind of like a novel idea or so, something that is really, um, um, just intangible, you know, a product sure. that you can't see, you really can't, you just kind of have to take a word for it. Right. Um, and then taking that and then getting better at, um, translating that into, you know, uh, solving a problem for they might be facing, you know, um, whether it be they're understaffed or they just too much or too little, right? It just, all the things that they would want to do that they thought about in meetings that would, hey, it's great if we could do this, but only if this vendor could connect to this vendor, connect, you know, but by going slowly and then I've seen a lot of the value of ourselves. We're seeing just being out there on location and stuff like that, just kind of putting things together. We're like, a lot of it came from, you know, I make a phone call to Miles. Be, hey, I'm out here in such a state. What would you think the lift on something like this would be? Here's kind of the issue that this guy was telling me about. It would be great if we could do this, but I think we could replicate it. Um, and then just start start doing it. And um, there were some ones that uh, really worked out well. And then that's just kind of how we went. We just We just never talked about the product itself. More so examples of what people are doing with it. You know, a lot of our success, Jake, has really come from the oil field itself is beginning to transition. Yep. Uh, we originally founded the business on the thesis that we're, we're moving toward a real-time application, that mm -hmm. everybody's going to be connected. And we've seen that a lot of the vendors on location are maturing technologically. Yep. A lot of the, while there's still the good, good old boy network the oil field's been known for, we've also seen, you know, a lot of the younger 30 and 40-year-olds who've risen with technology, now they're in decision-making positions. They're the ones that want to write code. They're the ones that want to integrate. And so we've had a lot of success because the companies themselves, 
the paradigm for what's acceptable and what's anticipated is beginning to shift. And so it's been a very easy thing to integrate with those that are willing. So it's given us a lot more, it's facilitated our success and theirs. Yeah. Cause you know, uh, sometimes you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, we've grown organically, right? We have put nearly $0 into marketing, um, brand awareness and things like that. It's just been kind of word of mouth. And then that right person gets one of you that call you, they see you're not full of shit and they're like, let's try this. And then we do it and just hit it out of the park. And then it's, it's just on from there. That's how it's really happened. So is that how this new product kind of came to be? Um, yeah. Uh, well, so what's about what it, what it is it? Pulse. 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 Okay. So it's Pulse by Rivet and it's, it's going to be the, the visual aspect. Now I, okay. I, I am cautious to say dashboards, right? Because y'all went pretty gung ho about no dashboards, no visualizations <laughs> two years ago. I mean, no, obviously things yeah, change. I mean, we've clung to that, man. We've clung to it. But hey, there's we, there's needs that are out there. Yeah, and you have to address market needs. What so let's just talk about the elephant in the room. Sure. What all the other people that you mentioned earlier yeah. have dashboards and visualizations and stuff. So sure. what is that need in the market today? Right. So the way we see it is that we have this large data stream. And essentially, it's, a, it's like a glass bottom boat floating across a reef. We're going to allow a, a pane of glass to configure and see. And how do we do that? When we have all this data, so what we do is we, we've built this tool that allows them to, to come in and build their own configurations and charts and their own layouts. And so instead of us saying this is Rivet's treatment plot and this is all the value we're adding, we make it configurable right from the beginning. So just like we take a general solution approach to the hardware, now we're taking a general solution approach here. If you're a um, superintendent, you want to see an aggregation of different things. That's fine. You don't need to wait on a dev cycle. You just come in, click, 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 save it off. Now it's available, public or private, if you want to share it to your team. You want third-party viewers, so everybody on location has access to real-time data. You want to facilitate that communication without burdening the company, man? That's fine. We've got a QR code they can scan, and it allows them a limited access to that particular data on their mobile, on their laptop, and now they can facilitate it. So we're really trying to shift the whole idea of, hey, we're going to build you this one thing. Instead, you're, you can choose what to build. You don't have to wait on us. You can share it how mm-hmm. you want to share it. There's restrictions. We don't allow as much flexibility as if we built it, but you, you can iterate much faster. So there's the visual piece. And then we're, we're beginning to layer on the secondary aspects. Uh, we're centralizing chat. You'll, ha- you'll be able to come in and whether you're on pad, in the office, anywhere in the world, you'll be able to interact with those people. You have a centralized location, at least to facilitate communication. Uh, and then the, the next piece after that is we're building essentially a rules engine. Event detection, everybody has. Stage start, stage stop. But company A is different than company B. So what we're layering on top of that is you can come in and define simple no-code rules. Mm -hmm. This stream, this channel, greater, less than, equal to, for some duration. It's kind of like a Zapier. Sort of, yeah. 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 I mean, it's very much a Make or Zapier or anything like that. It's essentially a no-code, easy tool where they'll be able to come in and define their own events. So if you want to test events, that's fine. Push them into your dev instance, push them into production, see who made those events, see which Mm -hmm. one you want to capture. It'll allow for a lot more flexibility and a lot faster iteration to actually define what they want to define versus waiting on companies to develop new algorithms. Because what we've seen over these years is for the most part, it's simple rules. You don't need the complex. It helps to have some of the deep, the deep learning, yeah. but most of it is valve open, pressure up, rate above. Yeah. And that's, I mean, so Miles, that's, Miles and that's how we had met was working in this building for a company, um, Orva and a lot of, so I was more customer facing. And I remember that the biggest frustration there was waiting for something to change. And with the customer, so the customer's requesting something to yeah. change on say one of the dashboards right? and just waiting on that. Well, the thing was that it was a rigid structure at that time. You know, uh, it was, uh, the dashboard is what it, it is what it is. You, you get what you get. And well, one operator or one engineer or, you know, one DNC manager may say the stage isn't over until five minutes after the shut in, the ICEP, all that stuff, right? Okay. But the other company is like, we just want to call the stage after we cut prompt it and go to flush. 
Okay. So they're never happy. So the definitions were always different. Right. So why not allow them to create and control their own definitions at any time? And one functional group, you know, a larger operators may not care about a shut-in as much, you know, or they may be more interested because maybe they're shallower, low pressure wells, 25 <laughs> stages. But someone up north that's fighting 12-5 for 260 stages, you know, they're going to want to see different things, right? Um, so even in the same company, different completion groups for different business units want different event detection. They want different rules. And with other platforms, that's just not a possibility. Now, I understand some of them, I think one of them, I think Cora has their dev center and stuff, allows you to like code up something or whatever, but it requires, it's just another barrier. But with ours, it's like, if you know oil and gas and you know the parameters that you're looking for on a treatment plot already, and you know the equations, the arithmetic behind it that you learned as a PE or that's available to you at work, why not just simply say, when this channel is here, because this is why I measure when it crosses it on this graph or whatever the equation ends up being translates to, you know, the, the lines on the graph, you let them do it. Nobody knows their roles better than they do. So let them control it. And are these particular dashboards being seen in the field live or is these back in the back office there, or is it both? There's a little bit of both. So Miles, I'm going to cover the operational part a little bit more. So, um, and this, so our big thing, a couple years ago we're in here was like uh, democratization of data. I mean, it, it's so overused now that term, but it's true. It's like, just give everyone everything. And that's quite literally what we do. So we want to take a step further. So if we're going to do this visual piece, we're going to approach it with the same values, the same core values, of, uh, right? That we built the company on is access for everyone. So what it actually means is in the frack van, there'll be a screen up, but the company man, and the frac, uh, supervisor, treater, operator, what are you going to call them? They want to see certain things. They want to see how much in they have. They want to see tank levels, things. Can we complete a stage if we start right now? No, because there's only this many inches in the above storage tank, whatever the case is. Um, so they can go to that and see where everyone else is. Now, the wireline truck, they want that too, because a lot of places have eliminated, eliminated that radio communication. So they don't know. They have to wait for somebody to come walk in. But if they... Well, we have it now. I wish I had some photos for you, but it was, they're putting in screens now and it's just, it's a rivet, you know, pulse. And what it shows is whatever they want to see, right? Now, they'll have a QR code on the top. Now we've done, implemented like a geo restrictions. We're fixing the bugs and stuff like that. And also a, a, a time to live type deal. So like this QR code here, you say you're a hand or if you're on sand or your supervisor, it doesn't matter what it is. You walk up with your smartphone, you scan it. And all of a sudden, on your phone, that dashboard shows up. If you have the app, it'll be in the app. If not, it'll be on the browser. But it will update in real time at the same time everybody else is. So everybody's on the same page. So your guys are taking a break or they're in the john or something. They know how much time they have left. It's just that much more available. Everybody's literally on the same page. Everybody knows what's going on. And, I mean, it's just no one else does this. I never thought about, you mentioned the chat aspect, like, so with, with that, like, okay, so you guys are, is there like a countdown typically? Like, Hey, we're about to kick off another stage. Everybody needs in to be like, you'll see a lot of frat crews, really? 10 minutes, five minutes on flush. You'll, you'll okay. see that. And so, yeah, I just thinking about, to, you know, yeah. both of us are Marines, right? So like yeah. you think communication is communication the key to, and, key to yeah. yeah, I mean, they, well, I mean, frack, it's, uh, there's still as much as they re have reduced in general, the employee count on, you know, on location, the number of bodies, even skeletons, crews, whatever that means you want to call it, still about 30 people. And, you know, well, um, frack pads in South Texas, massive dude, massive and Permian, massive, just right. And dudes, you mean the trucks It's hot. I mean, what are you going to do? It's some, you know, it's, you're just scattered everywhere, but not everybody is radio, you know, how many people are on a pad on average these days? I would say 25 to 30, okay. um, service company. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, if you include, I'd say 30 is a, a safe bet, yeah. typically. So you could have all 30 people on their devices, uh, any device, um, working on uh, desktop apps for PC, desktop apps for Mac, actual proper apps, you know, app icon on your phone, there it is, or just on browser, anything that you could normally view something on, it, it adjusts. So yeah, everybody's so on it. 
is the, I want to get back into the hardware, but real quick, I have a question. Is mm -hmm. this specifically a product, it, like the person who's actually paying for this is the operator themselves or are you guys doing any interfacing with any of the service companies outside of just like giving them the analytics? Operator. Operator. Yeah, okay. that's the model today. Yeah. It's simplest. We're going to facilitate everything, enables you, provides more safety. You know, if you can communicate more cleanly, you don't have to cross red zones. You don't have to yeah. introduce extra RF with mm -hmm. live guns on location. Makes sense. And we, we supply our own Wi-Fi network. I mean, we can run this locally. So whether we have in far off locations or we're in somewhere where it's easily accessible, we can provide it in both. It's not a big deal. So walk me through, walk me through the hardware side a little bit more without getting hyper technical, but just walk me through. Cause I don't know if y'all, did y'all have that in the beginning? No, we started with Rubbermaids from Walmart and some, and Amazon. <laughs> some yeah. cheap Amazon stuff. Now hundreds of dollars from Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Let's walk through the evolution. That's, uh, that's, that's a great starting point, right? So <laughs> yeah. Rubbermaids, homemade uh, sensors and things and, yeah. and kind of how did, how did things evolve and where are you guys at today? A necessity and yeah. keeping, reducing our time on location. Um, and the guys, uh, out in the field, you know, just out of sight, out of mind. So it was more so the, okay, the first time we went out there, we did it. We were like, all right, we used, I mean, you wouldn't believe it if I showed you, but it was a joke to the operator, but in a good way, the operator came out and they were like, you know, cover their mouth a little bit. Like, that's it. I'm like, yeah, that's it. You want to see inside it? I don't care. Say what you want. And they took a picture of it and this. But the point was that we had done something that nobody else has done for them. Then they've been trying to get something like this done for, I don't know, seven, eight years, better part of a decade. And then two guys with a truck and some Harbor Freight stuff and some junk computers from Amazon pulled it off and they just couldn't believe it. Right. It was, it was the fact that it was so simple. It was so like rudimentary. Like there, we didn't have, it wasn't even DC wired. It was like, I hot wired it off the dome light in my truck. No, not really. But like it was, it was very low tech, like it very, very unexpected. Right. Yeah. So, um, going from that, it was just, it's been a slow evolution to it's problem solving. Yeah. It's yeah. problem solving. And then we always try to solve the problem yeah. more than one way. And then we always look CP, for long term. Yeah. CPUs are overheating. So let's switch to solid state and let's add vents. Hey, we're having power issues. Okay, let's dual home power and let's add battery backup. Mm -hmm. Hey, the our cables are getting run over. Let's switch to wireless. Okay, this wireless is okay. It's a hub and spoke. Can we switch to a kinetic mesh? So each time it yep. was just it's just iterative, right? Yeah, like we we capture the number of times we go to location. We capture yeah. why we went to location, and we don't want to go to location. You shouldn't see us except at rig up and rig down unless there's a major issue. And so that's been the case. We will typically. Mm -hmm. On a frack job that runs 60, 90 days, you'll see us twice when we rig up and when we rig down. Mm -hmm. The so network and hardware is all self-healing. So hardware boots back up. Everything just powers on its own. The software self-healing is smart. So for the most part, nobody sees us. Yep. How many, how many devices are actually on location would, at a time? Okay, so I'll take this one real quick then. Um, so um, the footprint has also shrank a lot on our devices. And we're talking like uh, almost quite literally like, you know, cell phone, right? Um, the 15, but maybe thicker, obviously. And you got a place to put it. But what we were, what we excel at is integrating and cooperating, collaborating with the other service companies because in order for us to be successful, everyone has to be successful. So we've gotten to a point to where we'll take these small devices that will connect directly into their devices, right? And then we will run a single cable of egress and it goes to a externally mounted radio. And, and that's it. Like the radio is the size of a regular, you know, as you got a kid, the Happy Meal is like a little hamburger. It's very small. Got some antennas, but it's a single line that goes into, into back into uh, the equipment. The point I'm making is there is nothing on the ground literally nothing on the ground like so we don't have to deal with cable management plans we don't have to be in those drive overs all those things it is 
from HSE or whatever you whoever it is at the upper, they really like it because a lot of the competitors have uh, thousands of feet of uh, network cable just strung so we did, everywhere. Yeah. So is it a, a local radio network? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah. it's. I mean, it's a military grade mesh system. The I mean, public you can't set buy up it, a lot of those in my day. Yeah, yeah I mean, you it's, would. <laughs> <laughs> it's as good as anything you would have ever had at yeah. comm school or in the field. And um, you asked how many, it's typically one to one. Okay. So if there's 10 vendors on location, uh, our network is best if we do a one to one because on our devices, they're individually powered and they connect to that vendor and they'll mm -hmm. always consume data and they'll store it there locally. So Ooh, if the radio sick. connection goes down, yeah, it's no problem. We'll we'll house it until yeah. radio comes back up or reconnects to the mesh. Where so if a vendor's on site, right? So they like like I guess like the frack van, right? Mm -hmm. Where are you actually like physically plugging? Oh, is there sure, like they, is there just like an like a no. hey, plug in here thing, or is no, it like no. you plug into well, a computer? Or? It, it just depends, right? So typically we go for where the control system is. Okay, the main part. Like we get down to, we've gotten really good at, at, at doing this in the integration. So we get down to like the 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 IO level, like as close as we can to the pulsating signals. We still do that, but we'll place. So it's a single, so a vendor will get two devices. They will get the small computation, right? It's a distributed com computation network in, in addition to the mesh network. So a small com computation device that's about this big. And I typically like the guys to mount it permanently. Oh, well in the uh, server rack, right? So you've got, uh, it's not in real. I can't remember what it is. It's a server rack. So we'll have small pieces and custom pieces and it'll literally slide in there and it just sits in there. And then we have the single line that comes out. One connection to AC power clean side, which is available in the server room, but that splits into two because it's POE. And then a single network cable will go outside. So you literally, unless you have key access to that server room, um, you wouldn't see it. And even if you went in there and looked for it, chances are you're not going to find it. Um, and that's by design. We don't want to be in the way, right? It's as less intrusive as possible. So, and then in smaller, um, someone who doesn't have a frack van, say it's like a wireline truck or something like that, we have even smaller devices that will go back behind their, um, where the cabinet mounting is and some of them are hardwired too for power and it just rides with them. And it's, I mean, even smaller, you literally, if you open the door to it and look for it, you could look straight at it and not realize it's, it's, it's ours. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Clay and his ops team typically do a good job of plug into their network. Is it a switch? Is it a port somewhere? Tie in. Uh, we've connected wirelessly. So they'll join our network. They'll broadcast. So in the beginning, was it like, Oh fuck, here's a new format. We've got to problem mm -hmm. solve and figure out how to hack you know, into it, the I mean it is, but it isn't because the way this the way the software is built is it's modular. So you have this ingress uh, service and then it pulls whatever it is, and then I just drop in whatever the transformer. And so MQTT versions kept differing, Modbus versions kept differing, protobuf versions kept differing, but it's fine because doesn't matter. We consume anything, we transform it, standardize it. So now we have this library of transformation tools that takes it from any vendor and then quickly transforms it into, it's just a, it's a dumb JSON. It's as simple as it could be. So if anybody's ever worked with any sort of modern data structure, it is a time series structure. It is, it's dumb and it is uniform, but it's boiled down to have everything that you need and nothing that you don't. Mm -hmm. What's been the hardest part of the last two years? Because you're seeing a lot of success now. Yeah. Um, having time for family. Having a life. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's a lot of, <laughs> you know, just general <laughs> challenges that come in. Like yeah. Getting up and knowing that when we, when we came here two years ago, it was just Clay and I. Yeah. And now there's W-2s and contractors and... Insurance. As the company this, grows, the problems grow. As the company grow. grows, you're, yeah, the problems grow. They mature, but like, how do you handle these Two people that are, you know, kind of, I mean, we have a lot of consultants we lean on and mentors, mm -hmm. but a lot of it's been uh, relationship management, uh, the structures. How are we budgeting properly? You know, how, when do we reinvest? How do we reinvest? When do we get aligned? Should we continue with coaching? Should we not? Can, like, you know, there's a lot of meta entrepreneurship that 
isn't in a whole lot of books. It's not in a lot of classes. You just kind of, I mean, y'all have experienced this. Y'all have had mm-hmm. a lot of success, but the first few times it was, didn't achieve this. And so I think we've just been, <laughs> you know, eyes closed, feeling, feeling forward. Yeah. It's, it, especially when it's uncharted territory, you know, like for us, like we've never been to, to this point, at least with none, of, with none of my companies in the past have we been to this point. And so now it's, it's all unfamiliar. Yeah. It's all new problems. But it, it's good though. I mean, it just makes you, makes you more well-rounded, I suppose. You know, it's things, I'll say this, like things that used to stress me out two years ago, like I'll just like delete that email and worry about it when it actually becomes a problem. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Is it, I've had to adapt and I've had to learn how to mitigate my own um, stresses and my own, you know, what can wait, what needs done now. Um, but, you know, then, then one thing that we both have to work on is nobody besides you who are, who owns the business, you know, um, is going to work at the same pace or the same passion or effort. And you have to accept that, right? And not punish or punish, but not um, reward somebody who, who works, you know, super hard over somebody who has, we'll say, a better work-life balance, right? You have to remember that these people don't see the business as you see it. They see this as work and they're off work and they're, they're done. I'm done. See you. See you, Jack. Like, I'll be back in two weeks. You know, so not just not having managing expectations um, and not getting, you know, your feelings hurt and, you know, someone's able to just walk away from it and they seemingly don't give a shit. What do you mean don't give a shit? Oh, wait, that's right. You didn't put your family at risk of financial ruin and, um, and you know, all the stress on the family too. On top of it, they, 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 they don't give the same kind of a shit that you give because you've got all the skin in the game. And, um, and that being said, we've yeah. experienced that in limited amounts. The team we have today. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's fantastic. They have made sacrifices. They have left better paying opportunities because oh they were God, interested in what we were building. And so one dude sold his house I so mean, he could stay to afford to stay on because we couldn't pay him shit our, ourselves. I mean, so the, we have faced that, but I just want to make sure that yeah. they know that the team we have today, they are, they have been phenomenal. You know, one thing. One thing that we found that was stress in the beginning, and I think y'all felt this as well, and I remember this story, is y'all were having a really hard time, and then uh, you were able, you had the opportunity to buy back some of your time through hiring people and through mm-hmm. scaling, essentially capital scaling. And I found that to be one of the greatest tools when you're able to do it is offsetting those things that need to be done, but that you're not ex- expert at. Like, I write code, that's great, but I don't keep great books. So, hey, find the right accounting team. Find the right software consultants. Find the right uh, financial platform. Find the right debt management system. Mm-hmm. Get good partnerships with banks. We found that buying back our time has probably been the greatest lever. Getting that time back in droves for the dollars we spend. Yep. Man, that. 100%, man. Absolutely. You have to continue to hire to replace yourself. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of times you've heard this quote a billion times, you know, A, a players who are, who are not confident hire B players who hire C players and then you just have a shit organization. But you should always be striving to find people who are much better at whatever you're hiring them for than you. And I think that's lost on a lot of people. They want to hire people who are, and whether this is a, a product of being insecure or um, just maybe not to afford, be able to afford the right kind of talent. And that's, there's yeah. definitely like a, you know, place for that at the, at the time. But you want to be able to hire people who can come in and tell you where this needs to go rather than micromanage every single person. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Every, everyone's had their moment too, like the guys up in the Northeast. So um, I'll just t- say their names because, so Brandon, he came in. I was, I tried to get Brandon before we even came on the show like two years ago. And he's like, hey, I love you, Clay, but I'm piss off. And he's like, hey, I love you, Clay, but you don't have enough money. I look, okay. And then he was like, okay, well, then then finally when he came on, everyone else was over there. It was like, oh, thank God. Great. And um, he has drastically improved the quality of my life 
because one, he knows far more about hardware uh, than I do. And, um, and not only does he know a lot about it, but he's smart about it too. He comes, he does things in ways that I wouldn't have or even thought of. And because of that, that's why we have, you know, but, you know, we'll go, I don't know. We've gone 90 days, 120 days without having to go out to a single pad for a rig up that we already did. But it's like, but because of the way that Brandon came in and designed some stuff and, and set it all up, you know, you don't go with there. So he made the other guy's lives easier too. It, it, it's just cutting. I mean, you know, it adds up the number of miles driven, uh, the number of hours spent on location. It's OSHA, OSHA exposure hours. It makes a big difference in the insurance, man. Like it really does. And those are all, you know, but right. Reducing that, keeping the guys off the road and things like that. It's been huge. Right. So, you know, let's say that for him. And then now's real new pulse. Um, Jamie, uh, he's dude's a stud and he's a frac supervisor for years and uh service supervisor and other things. And he knows it like the back of his hand, but he also knows what it's like to manage several crews, not just one, not just a shift, but several crews in the basin. And he's been a huge help. He knows no code. He doesn't really know much about electronics what Brandon does, but what he does know is how people are going to use this because he's seen, he's seen it all. I mean, he came from there to, to rivet. So, you know, he's seen the gambit of everything. They've worked for all the major operators. You know, he, he was at a huge company too and small, but he's seen them all. And he's like, yeah, so, you know, that's dog shit. No one cares about it. I don't care about it. He's like, if I was running these crews, this is what I want to see. So he'll put, built this dashboard. You know, we just gave him the keys and let him run. And he built something and then he showed it to me. He's like, well, this is really cool. If you ask anybody about it, he's like, yeah, earn it by so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. They're like, can I have this? Can we do this now? And so that's been invaluable. I mean, there's other people, you just, you never know. Someone's, you know, their, their value may be even higher, the most unexpected places. It's going back to your, your uh, point about problem solving. I think it's one of the most important parts about building a business is you're really just building a team who can go out and execute. Sure. Right? Yeah. If you got a big technical challenge in front of you and you're like, fuck, I don't know how to solve this. Well, I should find somebody who knows how to solve this. Yeah. Right? That seems to be, once again, lost on so many people thinking that you naturally have to do everything yourself or you have to learn everything yourself and lead the way and then, you know, hire people who are. In, when it's well, actually the inverse. Yeah. And the guys that we do have was real quick, like, um, you know, they're, they're all good at, um, doing that. Like they're, they are all used to that. Like if they can't find it or they don't know how to do it, they all have really great networks too. Yeah. We really lucked out with these guys, but they, they'll lean on their network and then we'll find somebody who can do it and we'll have to pay them. Or if we don't have to pay them, we'll just have to owe them a favor later or something like that. It might be something small, but like something that is, a critical piece before he can even continue. Yeah. It's like, it's what I tell him all the time. Use your resources. You know, there's a reason why we're here is people like you, you know, you, you, we try to find the balance between the like super smart and weird and kind of savant and, you know, the friends with everybody, but just doesn't do anything. Right. So we found healthy media. What are you guys most excited about? You know, this, uh, this new product, Pulse, is really exciting. Um, I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunity in areas that we don't yet expect. I think that with this foundation that we're building, questions that we haven't even thought of are going to be asked of us. And so that's, it's also, from just a straight nerd point of view, like the code that I'm writing to support some of this and the code Dylan's writing to support some of this it's not something we've ever done. It's not a, it's, it, it's non-standard. It's atypical. It's got to scale in massive ways, but it has to be healing and it's got all the distributed architecture needs. So it's just, it's fun. Like, mm -hmm. The problems that we've been solving until recently, not that we haven't had them, but we've, we've reached that uh, sort of an asymptote with our hardware deployments where it's pretty damn good and it's solid yeah. and the hardware and the software is functioning. So it's, it's been invigorating to the whole team because, hey, here's this brand new thing where all this new opportunity is coming. The devs are excited. The implementation team, the field guys are excited. The customers are giving us positive feedback. So it's generated this really cool flywheel effect where while there's a lot of pressure each day and the pace has quickened, it's, it's really 
energized everybody across the board. Yeah, he's exactly right. It's, dare I say, kind of fun again. <laughs> I mean, it's been, it's been fun. It's more fun now. Yeah. There are certain days. I mean, anybody that's run a business knows there's some days you just want to pull the plug and crawl head first into your sleeping bag. Like just like yesterday, I won't get specifics, but I was getting on this flight to come back for the show. And I was in Northeast with the team and I sent, uh, it was a risky click. I sent an email. It was a risky email. And sometimes things don't go your way. And I was just flat and just, I don't know. I can just, just kind of like, Fuck just happened. Now I have to get on this plane. And it's just, you know, but then this morning I woke up and um, I don't know what's did Up and down is crazy. It's wild. But um, but working together, work, you know, just I would, would like for other people to be able to see it because it's, you know, sometimes you just take a step back and you say, man, these guys are killing it. Like, it's just unreal. Everyone's strong in their own way, right? And I don't know. Everyone just works really well together. Miles does a really good job. But he's kind of rare, actually, very rare, is that he knows, you know, uh, coding, uh, really developing in software engineering very, very well. Um, more than proficient, you know, right? And can write really elegant stuff in a short amount of time. But he can also manage people, those guys that we have, the devs that we have now. But then he is also good at translating to the business value as well. Like, to me, it's, it's a perfect example. I'd be the perfect example. I'm like, we're on these calls, this and that, whatever. I'm just waiting for the part where I have two seconds to say what I think about it, <laughs> right? And then it's just like, Miles can, in lay terms, tell me what's going on and exactly what this means and timing. And then he's just like, oh yeah, sure, blah, 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 blah. Right, it's cool to watch that. You know? And the other guys too. I mean, it's, it's really like on the, on the software side right now that it's, they're the ones that are like, Pulling, they're the ones that are pulling the cart right now, right? You know, and it, it's nice to watch. So. Well, guys, this has been, it's been an exciting update, especially seeing where you guys have been since the very beginning, knowing where you were at last time you came on the show, to all the success you've had over the past few years, how things have continued to evolve, how your looks have continued to evolve, Miles. <laughs> Every time I see you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Clay's just over here getting older. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm blossoming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my golden years. <laughs> this has been awesome. Uh, I'm super excited for you guys. Thanks, man. So I'm Thanks, ready. To, ready to do this again in a, another year or two. Yeah, sounds good, man. Appreciate yeah. you having us. If yeah. people want to find out more information about you guys, what's the website? Rivet.com. Search for us on LinkedIn. Either yeah. Miles and Clay or Rivet, and yeah, direct contact or hit the website. Yeah, we'll um. I mean, look for stuff on LinkedIn here in the near future. Like, well, I don't know when this is going to be on. So I guess by the time, you know, this airs or yeah. stuff, it'll, it, it'll be up there. But we'll be putting up, you know, pictures of, you know, everything, location, um, the different things, people using Pulse. We'll have visuals and things like that probably on the website where people can take a look. Let's be honest, this is going to become our most popular product. It is because you can see it and you can do stuff with it. And you can play with it. You interact with it. It will yeah. be, you know, despite that all the brilliant pieces and work that was done to build the back end, but whatever. Love it. Awesome guys. Thanks for making the time. Thanks, Jake. Catch you guys in the next episode.